John McCaslin is executive chairman of John McCaslin Architects, uh, which he founded back in 1996. The practice boasts an enviable variety of work, including infrastructure buildings in London and Sydney, museums, offices, housing, and placemaking. He was also involved in the international response to the Haiti earthquake in 2010 and restored the iconic market buildings in Port-au-Prince. Now, John, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about recovery as we hopefully start to emerge from this pandemic uh, and, and in the context of your experience of working with people who lost everything, and even a decade later are in a pretty parlour state, uh, does that experience help you to contextualise what we're facing here at the moment? As a practice, and, and for me personally, I mean, the issues, societal issues like this have always been of interest. So the work we did in Haiti was part of that interest that we've always had. And... I think it's important to, in a way, contextualize the problem. I mean, <clears throat> in Haiti, was at one point one of the richest, but is now one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. You know, in January 2010, when the earthquake struck, uh, about 300,000 people died, a million and a half were left homeless. And you know this, the capital and its surroundings were left in a ruinous state. Um, if you also consider then a few weeks later in Chile, uh, an earthquake with roughly the same seismicity occurred in an urban area and 67 people died. And in a way, the tragedy of Haiti was the tragedy of, of you know, buildings built in the wrong place, poor building techniques, and therefore unnecessary deaths. And so going to Haiti and working in Haiti, I was really, was, was a sort of extraordinary experience because we were there at the, you know, a couple of weeks after the earthquake and we could see the, see the ruins and the terrible catastrophe close at hand. But what really struck me was the, was the resilience and of the Haitian people who were remarkable and the way that you know, the country tried to get itself back in its feet very quickly. Obviously, it's taken an awful long time because it's such an impoverished place. But so when you look at that and then you look at the pandemic now, the two are kind of, you know, so different. What I think is kind of interesting, if you, if you consider that, you know, and I'm not sure if this is precisely the question, but if you consider that Britain's performance in the pandemic, I don't think it's been, certainly in the early stages, I don't think we covered ourselves in glory in terms of our slow response. And so if you sort of compare that to an emergency response in Haiti, which was immediate, our response was very poor. So you think, well, why would a country as sophisticated as Britain not have responded? You know, we lost six weeks or whatever it is, and therefore we're not prepared. <clears throat> so preparedness, is something which I think has absolutely come through the pandemic now is being prepared for something like this if it ever happened again. And the, but, but in terms of Haiti comparables, I mean, if you think of the extraordinary way that the British public and the NHS, how people have rallied together and communities have rallied together, I mean, that has been remarkable. How I think it's brought out the best of not just here, but in other countries, how people have managed to withstand this extremely difficult circumstances personally and collectively. And then I think it's kind of interesting to note that if you if you think in Haiti or in Malawi where we've worked, you know, a fraction in percentage terms of people have died as a, of, of, of COVID than in the UK. Well, you may think, well, why is that? Why is it a tiny proportion of Haitians? Something like 500 Haitians have died in the pandemic. Well, that's recorded deaths in a country of 10 million people. Um, and it's not just, you know, it's not just climatic issues and various other things. It's, it's actually, it's frankly, it's because the, the population of Haiti, the average age is sort of 63, the people die. So it's, it's impacted, it's a, it's a condition that has impacted people over 65 or 75, where 75, 80% of the deaths have occurred. So making those comparisons are interesting that the poorest countries in the world have generally fared better in COVID than the more developed countries. 
principally because their populations are mostly rural, principally rural, but also because life expectancy is so much lower. As I said in the introduction, I mean, your work is enviably Catholic in the types of buildings that you're commissioned to do. I mean, is, is that something you aimed for when you started out in practice? Not really, Peter. I mean, I was looking through our old sort of back catalogue and there's a, a kind of mad range of work from the early years, which really was the fact that we were sort of offered things to do, like the early years of Delvin, London, let's say, old sheds in North, you know, N1, Colebrook Place, I remember was a shed that we, we, we developed for them, which we did actually a really, really nice project for. And then, you know, we, we, we got offered things that would come from odd, odd set of circumstances. And then we got involved in, you know, Red Hill Station via Jane Priestman. Um, who was a great lady, and you know that led to one that led to another. I think the one thing that connected it was we were always interested in buildings that involved end users. You know, end, the end user to me was critical. So we didn't really get involved in, and have never been involved in, you know, speculative office projects. For instance, not some. I mean, much as I'd like to have done speculative office, have been, but we never offered them. So it usually we, we sort of head. We veered towards projects which had, you know, which were either transport projects where there would be significant numbers of people using and where there was a kind of or cultural projects or education, working with existing, existing buildings, which was what we started with and which we still really enjoy. So whether it's King's Cross or the station we're doing in Sydney, which is new and old, we sort of seem to that kind of surgical approach to architecture, we like working with something that's existing and, and then refreshing and adding and extending it. Um, so no, so to answer your question, no real plan. I think just things just happened. And I think we've tried to make the connective tissue, the language of the buildings and the approach and the quality we try to achieve and the modernism as its base. So hopefully that's what connects it all up, but no particular, plan, although interestingly, we did set up in the practice in 2005, a kind of studio based arrangement where there was a cultural team and an education team, a transport team. And that was, I think that worked well, it became slightly harder to connect things up, if I was honest, and, um, and to make sure there was consistency across the approach, but at least it meant that you know, there was a kind of specialisms developed, which I think was sort of valuable. Otherwise, I don't think we probably have managed to secure some of the bigger projects that, you know, this King's Cross, well, King's Cross came before that central station, for instance, I don't think we'd have gotten unless we'd built an expertise in, a, in transport architecture, for instance, without denying the opportunity to do other things, you know, that idea of specialism, but sort of sector specialism is something which I think has got you know, which does interest me, I think. So what, what, what are the key projects going through the office right now? Well, we've got this, as, as you mentioned, we've got a Sydney office, um, which has got really three major projects. One is the central station, which is which is nearing completion with um, Woods Baggett, our partner architects there. And that's for the Metro. Um, uh, a Waterloo station, which is another station, which is principally an underground station, not a, there's not got a, so there's an oversight element, but we're not engaged in. Um, there's another rail project in Perth we're looking at. Um, there's a number of adaptive projects. So there's a, there's a sort of portfolio there. And then in Scotland, we're in Edinburgh, we've got a little office, we're finishing up the Burrell Museum mm -hmm. in Glasgow. Uh, for, designed by Barry Gasson in the 80s, or 70s, built in the 80s, uh, which has been great, much delayed with COVID, but we're getting there. Um, we have a new project for the National Galleries of Scotland, which is called the Artworks, and it's effectively a, a big store with conservation and research and a public interface, which is which is in Granton, so it's a re re cultural-led regeneration. Um, we have a business school, the Said Business School in Oxford, which is we're developing a new building for the British Museum in Reading, which is a again a store and research building. Um, 
We've got a number of projects in Moscow, which Aidan Potter leads, which are a mix of cultural and residential. Uh, we're doing a couple of big competitions, uh, one for Milan Olympics, Winter Olympics 2026, new station in Belfast, which is on site for, with Arab. Um, so we're very, I mean, we're very busy, but the, like if probably like most people that, you know, there is a point in the future, not in the far, too far distant future, when we see that this, you know, we need to fill, fill the order book up. Something of a cliff edge, not quite a cliff edge, but a quite a steep slope that we're gonna to have to fill up. But that, that's, you know, that's the same with everybody, I think. There's a lot of discussion at the moment in the London plan and proposed changes to the planning system about characterization. So I'm, I'm interested to hear your thinking on this in the light of the work in, you did in Doha, which seems to me, uh, it's a place that it exposes a, a modern aesthetic, yet is very much of its place and of its culture, in, in, in spite of having been designed by a pretty international cohort of architects. It does come down to what is the real character of the place and what is the quality and scale of building and mix of buildings that are going to emerge. And then if you turn to Misharif in Doha, I mean, that was effectively the project that was inspired by Sheikh Musa, who set about to build, rebuild the centre of the city, 30 hectares, so about the size of King's Cross which I happen to, I do think has got great character. I mean, what, what was achieved by Argent and others at King's Cross as a development, I think is fantastic in terms of, I mean, you mentioned David Chipperfield's building. There's some great new work there. Wilkinson Air's gas holders, you know, the Stanton Williams work there. Um, you know, it's all of a high quality. It's fantastically connected up. Brilliant. I mean, that to me is, if you're comparing development, you know, look at what happened at King's Cross and look what happened in Mesherab, comparable in a way, perhaps in quality. And like the difference is, is that there's 120 buildings at Mesherab, huge number of buildings, similar kind of scale mix, I guess, scale is relatively modest, but then rises, but is always sort of contained. And the key thing there is that like King's Cross, the mix, it's not just commercially led. There's, you know, if you think of St. Martin's, at, you know, the School of St. Martin's, if that, I can never remember what it's called, the School of the Arts, but it was called in King's Cross, you know, it's underpinned by four and a half thousand students. And at Mesherib, you know, it's underpinned by, you know, a new metro system, a new tram, cultural projects, uh, three mosques, um, I mean, it is truly, then there's residential, there's some offices, um, there's a school that we designed, it's, it is truly mixed use. So it's, it's mixed use, it's walkable, um, it, in, in a, it's sustainable in that, you know, that it, it's as far as one reasonably can. It's hugely expensive because of so much of the servicing is put below ground by virtue of its sort of engineering infrastructural design. But it does create a place which has, abs which absolutely, I think, ticks the character box because it's got a sense of it feels like a, you know, it feels like a real place. The placemaking element of Mesherab, I think, is, is particularly strong that, that, that it's, it's, it's managed to, it's framed by existing historic streets it reinterprets in a way the historic street pattern. The architecture isn't, is of its time. It doesn't try to be a sort of pastiche of the past, but there's, there are sort of fairly significant guidelines established for materials and scale and the like, which, which Arup and um, Eliza Morrison developed. So we all work within that. It's mostly new, but it's got a number of existing retained buildings, and we've developed five of the retained buildings as museums. So it's it's um, the establishment of guidelines, establishment of kind of placemaking rules, the scale, materiality, the mix, all makes it fills. I think fulfills that in a sense of place. You know, in, the, in that regard, it's a sort of exemplar, if you can call it that, for that type of character. You know, of creating a character which is authentic and you know, you feel works.